Section 11 of Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings. Chapters 28 and 29. Chapter 28. The Ascent of Archimedes. The broken, shaggy ramparts of the giant crater rose above us. We toiled upward out of the foothills, clinging now to the crags and pitted terraces of the main ascent. An hour had passed since we turned from the borders of the Marimbrium, or was it two hours? I could not tell. I only know that we ran with desperate, frantic haste. Anita would not admit that she was tired. She was more skillful than I in this leaping over the broken rock masses. Yet I felt that her slight strength must give out. It seemed miles up the undulating slopes of the foothills, with the black and white ramparts of the massive crater close before us. And then the main ascent. There were places where, like smooth black frozen ice, the walls rose sheer. We avoided them, toiling aside, plunging into gullies, crossing pits where sometimes we perforce went downwards, and then up again or sometimes we stood, hot and breathless, upon ledges, recovering our strength, selecting the best route upward. This tumbled mass of rock, honeycombed everywhere with caves and passages leading into darkness impenetrable, there were pits into which we might so easily have fallen, ravines to span, sometimes with a leap, sometimes by a long and arduous detour. Endless climb. We came to a ledge, with the plains of the Mare Imbrium stretching out beneath us. We might have been upon the main ascent for an hour. The plains were far down, the broken surface down there smooth now by the perspective of our height. Yet still above us, the brooding circular wall went up into the sky. Ten thousand feet still above us. I think it was that at least, or more. You're tired, Anita. We'd better stay here. No. If we could only get to the top... The ship may land on the other side. They would see us if we were at the top. There was as yet no sign of the brigand ship. With every stop for rest, we searched the starry vault. The earth hung over us, flattened beyond the full. The stars blazed to mingle with the earth light and illumine these massive crags of the Archimedes wall. But no speck appeared to tell us that the ship was up there. We were on the curving side of the Archimedes wall, which fronted the Mare Imbrium to the north. The plains lay like a great frozen sea, congealed ripples shining in the light of the earth, with dark patches to mark the hollows. Somewhere down there, six or eight thousand feet below us now, or even more than that for all I could tell, Miko's encampment lay concealed. We searched for lights of it, but could see none. Or had Miko rejoined his party, left his camp, and come here like ourselves to climb Archimedes? Or was our assumption wholly wrong? Perhaps the brigand ship would not land near here at all. Sweeping around the Mare Imbrium, the plains were less smooth, the shattered, crag-lined, crater-scarred region beyond which the distant Apennines raised their terraced walls. The little crater which concealed the Grantline camp was off that way. There was nothing to mark it from here. Greg, do you see anything up there? There seems to be a blur. Her sight, sharper than mine, had picked it out the descending brigand ship. The faintest tiny blur against the stars, a few of them occulted as though strangely an invisible shadow were upon them. A growing shadow materializing into a blur, a blob, a shape faintly defined. Then sharper, until we were sure of what we saw. It was the brigand ship. It came dropping slowly, silently down. We crouched on the little ledge. A cave mouth was behind us, a gully was beside us, a break in the ledge, and at our feet the wall dropped sheer. We had extinguished our little lights. We crouched, silently gazing up into the stars. The ship, when first we distinguished it, was central over Archimedes. We thought for a while that it might descend into the crater, but it did not. It came sailing forward. I whispered into the autophone, whispering by instinct, as though out here in all this airless desolation someone might overhear us. It's coming over the crater. Her hand pressed my arm in answer. I recalled that when, from the planetara, 
Miko had forced Snap to signal this brigand band on Mars, Miko's only information as to the whereabouts of the Grantline camp was that it lay between Archimedes and the Apennines. That was Grantline's first message to us, and Miko had relayed it to his men. The brigands from Mars now were following that information. A tense interval passed. We could see the ship plainly above us now, a gray-black shape among the stars up beyond the shaggy, towering crater rim. The vessel came upon a level keel, hull down, slowly circling, looking for Miko's signal, no doubt, or for possible lights of Grantline. They were also picking a landing place. We saw it soon as a cylindrical, cigar-like shape, rather smaller than the Planetara, but similar of design. It bore lights now. The ports of its hull were tiny rows of illumination, and the glow of light under its rounding upper dome was faintly visible. A bandit ship, no doubt of that. Its identification keel plate was empty of official passcode lights. These brigands had not attempted to secure official sailing lights when leaving for Akshan. It was an outlawed ship, unmistakably. And here upon the deserted moon there was no need for secrecy. Its lights were openly displayed, that Miko might see it and join it. It went slowly past us, only a few thousand feet higher than our level. We could see the whole outline of its pointed cylinder hull, with a rounded dome on top. And under the dome was its open deck space, with a little cabin superstructure in the center. I thought for a moment that by some fortunate chance it might land quite near us. There was a wide ledge a quarter of a mile away. Anita, look! But it went past, and then I saw that it was heading for a level, plateau-like surface a few miles further on. It dropped, cautiously floating down. There was still no sign of Miko, but I realized that haste was necessary. We must be the first to join the brigand ship. I lifted Anita to her feet. I don't think we should signal from here. No, Miko might see it. We could not tell where he was. Down in the plains, perhaps? Or up here, somewhere in these miles of towering rocks. Are you ready, Anita? Yes, Craig. I stared through the visors at her white, solemn face. Yes, I'm ready, she repeated. Her hand pressure seemed to me suddenly like a farewell. Were we plunging rashly into what was destined to mean our death? Was this a farewell? An instinct swept me not to do this thing. Why, in an hour or two, I could have Anita back to the comparative safety of the Grantline buildings. The exit ports would doubtless be repaired by now. I could get her inside. She had bounded away from me, leaping down some thirty feet into the broken gully, to cross it and then up on the other side. I stood for an instant watching her fantastic shape, with the great rounded goggled trunked helmet and the lump on her shoulders which held the little Lorentz motors. Then I made after her. It did not take us long, two or three miles of circling along the giant wall. The ship lay only a few hundred feet above our level. We stood at last on a butte-like pinnacle. The hull port lights of the ship were close over us, and there were moving lights up there, tiny moving spots on the adjacent rocks. The brigands had come out, prowling around to investigate their location. No signal yet from Miko, but it might come at any moment. A flash now, I whispered. Yes. The brigands had probably not yet seen us. I took the lamp from my helmet. My hand was trembling. Suppose my signal were answered by a shot. A flash from some giant projector mounted on the ship. Anita crouched behind a rock as she had promised. I stood with my torch and flung its switch. My puny light beam shot up. I waved it, touched the ship with its faint glowing circle of illumination. They saw me. There was a sudden movement among the lights up there. I semaphored. I am from Miko. Do not fire. I used the open universal code, in Martian first, and then in English. There was no answer, but no attack. I tried again. This is Haljan, once of the Planetara. George Prince's sister is with me. There has been disaster to Miko. A small light beam came down from the brink of the overhead cliff beside the ship. We read you. I went on steadily. Disaster. The Planetara is wrecked. All killed but me and George Prince's sister. We want to join you. I flashed off my light. The answer came. 
Where is the Grantline camp? Near here, the Mare Imbrium. As though to answer my lie, from down on the earth-lit plains, ten miles or so from the crater base, a tiny signal light shot up. Anita saw it and gripped me. There is Miko's light. It spelled in Martian, Come down, land Mare Imbrium. Miko had seen the signaling up here and was joining it. He repeated, Land Mare Imbrium. I flashed a protest up to the ship. Beware, that is Grantline, trickery. From the ship, the summons came. Come up. We had won this first encounter. Miko must have realized his disadvantage. His distant light went out. Come, Anita. There was no retreat now. But again I seemed to feel in the pressure of her hand that vague farewell. Her voice whispered, We must do our best, act our best to be convincing. In the white glow of a search beam we climbed the crags, reached the broad upper ledge. Helmeted figures rushed at us, searched us for weapons, seized our helmet lights. The evil face of a giant Martian peered at me through the visors. Two other monstrous towering figures seized Anita. We were shoved toward the port locks at the base of the ship's hull. Above the hull bulge, I could see the grids of projectors mounted in the dome side, and the figures of men standing on the deck, peering down at us. We went through the admission locks into a hull corridor, up an inclined passage, and reached the lighted deck. Our helmets were taken off. The Martian brigands crowded around us. Chapter 29 on the brigand ship. Anita's words echoed in my memory. We must act our best to be convincing. It was not her ability that I doubted as much as my own. She had played the part of George Prince cleverly, unmasked only by an evil chance. I steeled myself to face the searching glances of the brigands as they shoved around us. This was a desperate game into which we had plunged. For all our acting, how easy it would be for some small chance thing abruptly to undo us. I realized it, and now, as I gazed into the peering faces of these men from Mars, I cursed my witless rashness which had brought Anita into this. The brigands, some ten or fifteen of them here on the deck, stood in a ring around us. They were all big men, nearly of a seven-foot average, dressed in leather jerkins and short leather breeches, with bare knees and flaring leather boots. Piratical, swaggering fellows, knife blades mingled with small hand projectors fastened to their belts. Gray, heavy faces, some with scraggling, unshaved beards. They plucked at us, jabbering in Martian. One of them seemed to be the leader. I said sharply, Are you the commander here? I speak not Ilton well. You speak the Earth English? Yes, he said readily. I am commander here. He spoke English with the same freedom and accent of Miko. Is this George Prince's sister? Yes, her name is Anita Prince. Tell your men to take their hands off her. He waved his men away. They all seemed more interested in Anita than in me. He added, I am Set Potan. He addressed Anita. George Prince's sister, you are called Anita? I have heard of you. I knew your brother. Indeed, you look very much like him. He swept his plumed hat to the grid with a swaggering gesture of homage. A courtier-like fellow this, debonair as a Venus cavalier. He accepted us. I realized that Anita's presence was immensely valuable in making us convincing. Yet there was about this Potan, as with Miko, a disturbing suggestion of irony. I could not make him out. I decided that we had fooled him. Then I remarked the steely glitter of his eyes as he turned to me. You were an officer of the Planetara? The insignia of my rank was visible on my white jacket collar, which showed beneath the errant suit, now that my helmet was off. Yes, I was supposed to be, but a year ago I embarked upon this adventure with Miko. He was leading us to his cabin. The Planetara wrecked, Miko dead? And Han and Coniston. George Prince, too. We are the only survivors. While we divested ourselves of our rent suits at his command, I told him briefly of the Planetara's fall. All had been killed on board save Anita and me. We had escaped, awaiting his coming. The treasure was here, we had located the Grantline camp, and were ready to lead him to it. Did he believe me? He listened quietly. He seemed not shocked at the death of his comrades, nor yet pleased, merely imperturbable. 
I added with a sly, sidelong glance. There were too many of us on the Planetara. The purser had joined us, and many of the crew. And there was Miko's sister, the Setamoa. Too many. The treasure divides better among less. An amused smile played on his thin gray lips, but he nodded. The fear which had leaped in me was allayed by his next words. True enough, Haljan. He was a domineering fellow, Miko. A third of it all was for him alone. But now... The third would go to this sub-leader, Potan. The implication was obvious. I said, before we go any further, can I trust you for my share? Of course. I figured that my very boldness in bargaining so prematurely would convince him. I insisted. And Miss Prince? She will have her brother's share? Clever Anita. She put in swiftly. I give no information until you promise. We know the location of the Grantline camp, its weapons, its defense, the amount and location of the ore. I warn you, if you do not play fair with us. He laughed heartily. He seemed to like us. He spread his huge legs as he lounged in his settle and drank of the bowl which one of his men set before him. Little tigress, fear me not, I play fair. He brushed two of the bowls across the table. Drink, Haljan, all is well with us, and I am glad to hear it. Miss Prince, drink my health as your leader. I waved it away from Anita. We need all our wits. Your strong Martian drinks are dangerous. Look here, I'll tell you just how the situation stands. I plunged into a glib account of our supposed wanderings to find the Grantline camp its location off in the Mare Imbrium, hidden in a cavern there. Potan, with the drink, and under the gaze of Anita's eyes, was in a high good humor. He laughed when I told him that we had dared to invade the Grantline camp, had smashed its exit ports, had even gotten up to have a look at where the ore was piled. Well done, Haljan. You're a fellow to my liking. But his gaze was on Anita. You dress like a man, or a charming boy. She still wore the dark clothes of her brother. She said, I am used to action. Man's garb pleases me. You shall treat me like a man. Give me my share of the gold leaf. He had already demanded of us the meaning of that signal from the mare Imbrium, Miko's signal. It had not come again, though any moment I feared it. I told him that Grantline had doubtless repaired his damaged ports and sallied out to assail me in reprisal. And seeing the brigand ship landing on Archimedes, had tried to lure it. I wondered if my explanation were very convincing. It did not sound so. But he was now flushed with a drink, and Anita added, Grantline knows the territory near his camp very well. He is equipped only for short-range fighting. I took it up. It's like this, Potan. If he could get you to land unsuspectingly near the mouth of his cavern. I pictured how Grantline might have figured on a sudden surprise attack upon the ship. It was his only chance to catch it unprepared. We were all three in friendly, intimate mood now. Potan said, We'll land down there right enough, but I need a few hours for my assembly. He will not dare advance, I said. For one thing, he can't leave his treasure. He knows we have unmasked his lure, Anita put in smilingly. How Jean and I joining you, that silenced him. His light went out very promptly, didn't it? She flashed me a side gaze. Were we acting convincingly? But if Miko started up his signals again, they might so quickly betray us. Anita's thoughts were upon that, for she added, Grantline will not dare show his light. If he does, set Potan, we can blast him with a ray from here, can't we? Yes, Potan agreed. If he comes within ten miles, I have one powerful enough. We are assembling it now. And we have thirty men, Anita persisted. When we sail down to attack him, it should not be very difficult to kill all the Grantline party. Thirty of us. That's enough to share in this treasure. I'm glad Miko is dead. By heaven, Haljan, this girl of yours is small but very bloodthirsty. That accursed Miko murder her brother, I explained. Acting, and never once did we dare relax, if only Miko's signals would hold off and give us time. We may have talked for half an hour. We were in a small, steel-lined cubby, located in the forward deck space of the ship. The dome was over it. I could see from where I sat at the table that there was a forward observatory tower under the dome quite near here. The ship was laid out in rather similar fashion to the Planetara, 
though considerably smaller. Potan had dismissed his men from his cubby so as to be alone with us. Out on the deck, I could see them dragging apparatus about, bringing the mechanisms of great projectors up from below, beginning to assemble them. Occasionally, some of the men would come to our cubby windows to peer in at us curiously. My mind was roaming as I talked. For all my manner of casualness, I knew that haste was necessary. Whatever Anita and I were to do must be done quickly. But to win this fellow's utter confidence first was necessary, so that we might have the freedom of the ship, might move around unnoticed, unwatched. I was horribly tense inside. Through the dome windows across the deck from the cubby, the rocks of the lunar landscape were visible. I could see the brink of this ledge upon which the ship lay, the descending crags down the precipitous wall of Archimedes to the earth-lit plains far below. Miko, Moa, and a few of the planetara's crew were down there somewhere. Anita and I had a fairly definite plan. We were now in Potan's confidence. With this interview at an end, I felt that our status among the brigands would be established. We would be free to move about the ship, join in its activities. It ought to be possible to locate the signal room, get friendly with the operator there. Perhaps we would find a secret opportunity to flash a signal to Earth. This ship, I was confident, would have the power for a long-range signal, if not of too sustained a length. It was a desperate thing to attempt, but our whole procedure was desperate. And I felt, if Anita perhaps could cajole the guard or the duty man from the signal room, I might send a single flash or two that would reach the Earth. Just a distress call, signed Grantline. If I could do that and not get caught. Anita was engaging Potan in talking of his plans. The brigand leader was boasting of his well-equipped ship, the daring of his men, and questioning her about the size of the treasure. My thoughts were free to roam. A signal to Earth, and while we were making friends with these brigands, the longest-range electronic projector was being assembled. Miko could then flash his signal and be damned to him. I would be on the deck with that projector. Its operator and I would turn it upon Miko. One flash of it, and he and his little band would be wiped out but there was our escape to be thought of. We could not remain very long with these brigands. We could tell them that the Grant Line camp was on the Mare Imbrium. It would delay them for a time, but our lie would soon be discovered. We must escape from them, get away, and back to Grant Line. With Miko dead, a distress signal to Earth, and Potan in ignorance of Grant Line's location, the treasure would be safe until help arrived from Earth. It all fitted together so nicely. It seemed possible of success. Our futile plans, star-crossed always, doomed, fated always to be upset by such unforeseen evil chances. By the infernal, little Anita, you look like a dove, but you're a tigress, a comrade after my own heart, bloodthirsty as a fire-worshipper. Her laugh rang out to mingle with his. Oh, no, said Potan, I am treasure-thirsty. We'll get the treasure, never fear, little Anita. With you to lead us, Potan, I'm sure we will. A man entered the cubby. Potan looked frowningly around. What is it, Argyll? The fellow, answered in Martian, leered at Anita and withdrew. Potan stood up. I noticed that he was unsteady with the drink. They want me with the work at the projectors. Go ahead, I said. He nodded. We were comrades now. Amuse yourself, Hajan, or come out on deck if you wish. I will tell my men you are one of us. And tell them to keep their hands off Miss Prince. He stared at me. I had not thought of that. A woman among so many men. His own gaze at Anita was as leeringly offensive as any of his men could have given. He said, Have no fear, little tigress. Anita laughed. I am afraid of nothing. But when he had lurched from the cabin, she touched me, smiled with her mannish swagger for fear we were still observed, and murmured, Oh, Craig, I am afraid. We stayed in the cubby a few moments, whispering, trying to plan. You think the signal room is in the tower, Greg? The tower outside our window here? Yes, I think so. Shall we go out and see? Yes, keep near me always. Oh, Greg, I will. We deposited our rent suits carefully in a corner of the cubby. We might need them so suddenly. Then we swaggered out to join the brigands working on the deck. End of Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings 
chapters 28 and 29.